So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Sushmita Sarangi. Uh, Sushmita joined me at Georgetown um, just before the pandemic. Um, and when I took over as division chief, um, had a tremendous rebuilding task. I don't think I could have done that rebuilding without her. And she continues to be a vital uh, leader um, and program developer at Georgetown. And um, I'm really honored that uh, she's willing to give this talk today. She did her pediatric fellowship training um, uh, at uh, Long Island Jewish with uh, Jeff Lipton and company. And um, her training has set her up to be uh, an incredible pediatric hematologist today. So Dr. Serenke. Thank you, Jeff. I am uh, so honored to be here today. Um, and the topic that I've been tasked with is exploring the genetic underpinnings of high-risk leukemia. So let's go ahead and get started. As soon as I get the clicker to work. This one, the top one, right? The middle. OK, there you go. <laughs> so I'll get started with a recent patient we had. This is a 20-year-old Hispanic young man that we took care of who presented with easy fatigue, dizziness, and blurry vision. He was found to have pancytopenia and bilateral hemorrhages and leukemic infiltrates in his uh, retina. His bone marrow revealed the uh, classic flow cytometry of diagnosing pre-B cell leukemia. His cytogenetics, in addition, revealed an additional X chromosome and uh, some um, more material of unknown region, origin in the 19 chromosome. And then when we did his NGS, we picked up a 17Q gain and a P2RY8CRLF2 fusion. Now, this fusion is known to be uh, a pH-like mutation, so we knew that we are dealing with a high-risk patient. And we uh, started him on a four-drug standard induction as per the AALL 1731 protocol. And due to his retinal involvement with the leukemia, he also started retinal radiation. Um, not surprisingly, unfortunately, his MRD did not clear after induction. And um, in post-consolidation, the MRD had gone up to 6%. Um, we therefore switched him to uh, immunotherapy with blinitumumab, which is a CD19-directed treatment um, as per the adult tower protocol. And after one cycle of blinitumumab, he finally now has MRD negativity. So contemporary childhood leukemia studies have shown steady improvement in five-year overall survival rates exceeding 90%. Everyone is well-versed with these uh, survival curves. However, overall survival for some recently concluded studies, such as the St. Jude Total Therapy Study 16, was similar to the one that, was, that just preceded it, at both um, maxing out at around 94%. Therefore, with the conventional chemotherapy approaches, we are realizing that we have reached a threshold over which further intensifying chemotherapy is not going to improve our survival outcomes. And we are at a point that in order to improve outcomes and reduce adverse effects, we desperately need novel therapeutic approaches. Comprehensive sequencing and integrative genome-wide analysis have profoundly refined the taxonomy of ALL, resulting in the identification of new entities with both prognostic and therapeutic significance. The subtypes listed in red here have poor prognosis, whereas the ones highlighted in green are known to have good prognosis. And we are still finding out, discovering new subtypes whose prognostication is still not known and is, looked into, is, is being looked at. We do know that children and younger patients have an increased frequency of the good prognostic genetic lesions, such as the ETV, rung one fusions, or the hyperdiploid states, whereas the older patients and young adults have increased frequency of high-risk mutations, such as the pH, pH-like mutations or the KMT2A rearranged leukemias. 
So I want to highlight this study. This is actually uh, survival curves from a large adolescent adult study uh, from the ECOG E2993 cohort. It shows that when each genetic subtype is looked at more closely, the known good risk players, such as the ETV rung swan fusion or the DUX4 rearranged leukemias, are still doing pretty well in these older patients. Meanwhile, the pH-like or KMT2A rearranged or hyperdeployed varieties, which are more frequent found in this age cohort, I have still got disparate outcomes. So during normal B cell uh, generation, hemopoietic stem cells give rise to progenerators that pass through steps of lineage commitment and differentiation to eventually become mature B cells. Chromosome translocation that result in fusion proteins, so the example here uh, shown is the Pax5 ETV6 fusion, can block this B cell differentiation and leads to a distinct population of early P B cells which have limited survival capacity in normal conditions. The occurrence of secondary mutations can now you know, affect tumor suppressors or oncogenes, and they enhance proliferation of uh, survival and initiates this B cell leukemic process. Each subtype typically has co-occurring uh, cooperative events or genetic alterations that perturb the lymphoid development, cell cycle regulation, and kinase signaling pathways. So let us explore some of these high-risk molecular B-cell leukemias and what challenges we are facing in the present day. The first one I'm going to talk about is the Philadelphia positive ALL. Um, the Philadelphia chromosome was the first cytogenetic abnormality associated with human cancer discovered in 1960. It was found to be due to a translocation of the AB, a, ABL1 encoding region of chromosome 9 with the BCR region of chromosome 22 that goes on to create a fusion oncogene leading to an oncoprotein that when phosphorylated leads to constitutional activation of tyrosine kinase. This further leads to increased cellular survival and proliferation. Tyrosine kinase inhibitors, also known as TKIs, developed in the early 2000s like imatinib, were found to be highly effective in blocking the active ATP binding site of the BCR ABL1 fusion protein, thereby preventing phosphorylation and cellular proliferation. And this discovery actually heralded the era of targeted medicine in treating cancers. TKIs have greatly improved induction treatment with later generation of drugs like desatinib and ponatinib, proving to be even more potent targeting of the BCR ABL fusion protein. So current overall survival rates of pH positive ALL are up to 86%, which is almost double of what it was in the pre-TKI era. Hematological remission can be achieved in 94 to 100%, even with a chemo-free approach, just by the addition of TKIs. This study, the GMEMA uh, uh, LAL 2016 Phase II Adult Protocol, it evaluated the addition of blinitumumab to only steroids and desatinib. And um, there you go, 98% had hematological remission at end of induction. And the rate of molecular response shown in the furthest column in this table, if you go down, um, it shows that with every additional cycle of additional blinitumumab, um, the molecular remission increases. So so overall survival from this trial is at, at, at three years is uh, around 80%, which is pretty good. Now let's uh, tackle another uh, high-risk subtype called pH-like ALL. So pH-like ALL is characterized by a gene expression profile similar to Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL, but it lacks that typical classic BCR-ABL gene fusion. Just as in pH ALL, the incidence increases with age and is about 25 to 30% of all B-cell ALL in the adolescent and young adult population. It's also been found to be more associated with individuals of Hispanic and Native American ancestry, and it's associated with high end rate of end induction MRD with treatment, just as we saw in our patient from before, and also with relapse. As you can see by these survival curves, both EFS and overall survival are lower across all age groups in this subtype of ALL. pH-like ALL is characterized by kinase-activating mutations. 
50% are associated with overexpression of CRLF2 and uh, leads to uh, aberrant signaling activation. These can result with either a fusion with, of IGH with CR, CRLF2 or uh, a CRLF2 to P2RY8 fusion. 50% of these kind of um, 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 uh, subtypes will also have an activating point mutation of JAK1 or JAK2. The remainder of the PH like ALL are associated with kinase alterations from fusions of ABL class genes or rearrangements of JAK2 fusion proteins or the EPOR receptor. Normal activation of CRLF2 occurs upon the binding of this thymic stromal lymphoproietin, um, which induces a conformational change result resulting in receptor dimerization. This further leads to STAT5 phosphorylation and JAK STAT pathway activation. And we know that once that's activated, that leads to oncogenic CRLF2 overexpression and aberrant signaling activation. So taking a closer look at the CRLF2 rearrangement, CRLF2 is located at the pseudo-autosomal region, uh, one of um, sex chromosomes X or Y, resulting in a high level CRLF2 cell surface expression. Focal interstitial PAR1 deletion can lead the CRLF2 part to join to the first non-coding region of the P2RY8 gene, leading to the production of uh, this uh, fusion transcript. Translocations, which are often cryptic, can also lead to the fusion of CRLF2 to IGH and a recurrent activating mutation in the CRLF2 uh, at point F232C has also been reported. So why is it important to know these? Well, um, the P2RY8 CRLF2 is classically can be picked up only by RT-PCR. They cannot be picked up by conventional cytogenetics, whereas the IGH the CRLF2 nowadays can be picked up by FISH. So if you use conventional cytogenetics, you're gonna miss these lesions, okay? And it has a lot of therapeutic implications, so we really need comprehensive testing for all our leukemia patients um, across the board at this time. Patients with this P2RY8 CRLF2 fusion tend to be lower in age group and they are associated with a low white count, so they will be classified as NCI low risk if you do not know the genetic trans uh, translocation, so it's important to really have this comprehensive analysis in our hand uh, to classify them properly. The IGH CRLF2 fusions are associated with older age group and a higher white count at presentation. Also interestingly, P2RY8 uh, CRLF2 fusions have uh, been found uh, in um, uh, more incidents in trisomy 21 patients, whereas the IGH CRLF2 fusions are uh, seen more in Hispanic and Native American patients. It's thought because they are associated with the higher rates of this GATA3 polymorphisms that they tend to have this fusion more. So what can we do to target this overexpression of CRLF2? Well, this is a study of ruxolitinib, which is a known JAK inhibitor in eight patient-derived murine xenograft models of B-cell leukemia with JAK2 or CRLF2 mutations. In six out of eight of these models, treatment with ruxolitinib significantly lowered the peripheral blast count as shown in the dotted line as compared to the vehicle, which is showed in um, the um, uh, solid line. Ruxolitinib is be, was evaluated in the COG study AAL, AALL1521, and we are eagerly um, awaiting mature efficacy data by the end of next year to see um, how it did. The other class, the ABL class fusions, um, were looked at in pediatric patients treated on the uh, European IEOP BFM 2000 or 2009 protocols. They had 13 patients who had had TKIs added at the discretion of the treatment uh, physician, and they were looked at retrospectively. Eight were added during induction or consolidation, four after consolidation, and one after stem cell transplant. As can be expected, this cohort actually had a higher end of induction and end of consolidation MRD. Patients to be treated with TKI had high-risk features and majority of them actually needed a stem cell transplant. 
Ultimately, as can be seen in the study, the five-year event-free survival and overall survival did not really significantly uh, change in either the TKI versus the no-TKI group. Um, of course, this was a small patient population, and we are awaiting data on the efficacy of TKIs in several larger ongoing clinical trials, including the AALL 1631 by the COG. The um, KMT2A rearranged leukemias, uh, previously known as mixed lineage leukemia or MML uh, gene, um, is present on the long chromosome of, um, a long arm of chromosome 11, and it encodes a set domain histone methyl transferase that is important for the maintenance of hemopoietic stem cells. Now, this KMT2A um, is a target of chromosomal translocations in both adult and pediatric leukemias, and mostly it leads to a fusion of the N terminus of KMT2A with a number of different uh, partners. So KMT2A rearrangement is uh, most commonly seen in young children, so everyone knows this is uh, associated with infant leukemias, and is associated with a worse prognosis despite the use of aggressive multi-agent chemotherapy approach. Several potential therapeutic targets are being currently studied. There is some evidence that um, allogenic stem cell transplant in CR1 might improve the prognosis for patients with risk factors in this kind of leukemia. Uh, notably, patients with leukemia appear to fare poorly with antigen-directed uh, therapy due to a propensity of these kind of rearrangement, uh, rearranged leukemias to undergo lineage shift or um, antigen loss when CD19 or CD22-directed therapies were used. This has been observed by both uh, blenitumumab as well as CD19-directed CAR T cells when used in this kind of leukemia. Clinical trials evalu evaluating uh, venetoclax and menin inhibitors are currently underway. Similarly, there are several other high-risk ALL subtypes, such as hypodiploid varieties, amplification of long arm of chromosome 21, MEF2D, and deletions in the Icaros uh, transcriptional factor, which are all associated with less than 50% EFS. Some of these subtypes' response to therapy intensification, especially based on an MRD response, um, and the role of novel agents, such as BS BCL2 inhibitors and histone deacetylate um, inhibitors in some of these subtypes need further study. So uh, this, with this, I will conclude that there are distinct gene expression patterns in leukemia in ALL caused by a wide range of genetic alterations that converge on specific pathways. And uh, identifying these pathways is crucial for therapeutic targeting and demands the incorporation of gene expression approaches in the clinical diagnostic workup of ALL. Some of the ongoing work is in pH-like ALL, which has been recognized to have a poor outcome with current therapy. We have seen that just in pH ALL, the addition of TKI in this kind of ALL can result in outcomes similar to stem cell transplantation. Um, Jack start pathway inhibition uh, trials are, are, are currently underway, and uh, results are awaited for some of these concluded ones. And we have also seen that there's a role of novel agent inhibition of a BCL2, such as venetoclax, in KMT2A rearranged leukemias. So we're also awaiting, I didn't talk too much about this, but data is from several studies utilizing upfront immunotherapy approaches in, the, in these high-risk molecular ALL subtypes. And with this, I would like to thank um, everyone, and especially the Children's Cancer Foundation for giving me this opportunity to do this presentation today. And this is my incredible team at Georgetown, um, without which uh, I will not be able to do the work and take care of these high-risk patients. Thank you. So fantastic um, talk and wonderful to stay on time, that we have time for a couple of questions. So if people have questions, you can raise your hand. Steve has got a microphone. Um, and over there, and Dan's got a microphone, right. But uh, questions? Yes, over here. Hello. Hello, great talk. Um, so I'm interested in how you're using this um, biomolecular chemistry in terms of how you're describing the need for genetic testing to patients and their families because um, you know given the shift towards patient-centered care and the subtypes of ALL rapidly expanding I find it hard to explain this concept to patients and families um, in a way that's not filled with jargon and doesn't need a, a 
a deep understanding of uh, biomolecular genetics. So how do you phrase it to patients and families that you need to do gen genetic testing that may help pa uh, patient outcomes, but may delay treatment a little bit? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, the question is about um, how do you explain to the families about adding genomic testing in their diagnostic workup and how we frame that to them? Well, I frame it like because we have these targetable mutations and there are, um, you know, therapies out there that can help. Uh, that's how I frame it. Like we're going to look at the deep dives, deep dive into the genetics of your leukemia a little bit more to see if we can add something else which will target or add personalized medicine uh, to your treatment. And they're very, very excited about that possibility if that's uh, available to them. Yeah, and it depends on the patient, honestly, how deep they want to go into. So we, I can, I've had talks with the entire like similar presentations to families, whereas otherwise they all need to know it's just, it's a high-risk mutation and the doctors are trying to treat it. But thank you. Other questions? Uh, yeah, right. Yes, for, for Zoom, we probably need microphones and everything, is that right? The, um, so if you'd tolerate a question from a sarcoma doctor, but, uh, so I... She has to deal with the sarcoma doctor all <laughs> the right, time. That's right, so, that's right, that's yeah. right. Um, I, just, just your thoughts, so I think it's very interesting how, for instance, like CML, right, BCR able, there seems to be no wiggle room for that leukemia, right, around that, that tyrosine kinase, right? It's like, if you block it, it's done. So what do you think about, like, the BCR able, like, you know, where, where it's, it seems like TKIs, right, is not kind of the magic bullet for those, you know, is it maybe not the best, I mean, maybe is it not the driver mutation of those leukemias, or just your thoughts on that, because I think it's very interesting how TKIs maybe aren't, yeah. or we're still yeah. fi figuring out the place, even though it seems like those drugs should work. Yeah, no, I mean, when I had this patient, I actually had a couple of back-to-back -back patients with the same mutation, so I was like, oh, should I, should I be using TKI right now? But this, like you said, it's not a home run for this pH-like mutations yet. And I think it's because they're, um, they're also associated with these other activating JAK1 mutations that we're just beginning to understand. So we, we will need to figure out maybe adding something else to shut another pathway down, or I don't think um, just going after a TKI is going to be home run. But you know, um, these just completed clinical trials by the COG will give us some answers, hopefully. 